Hi folks, it's good to be with you. We're looking at Battle for the Bible. Don't forget Royal Blood Ministries. Pray for it and don't forget my website, jasonbirdspreacher.com, Royal Blood Ministries, website, Facebook, Twitter, etc. My Facebook, Twitter. We're looking at this book. It's good to be with you. Battle for the Bible by David Marshall. It's an excellent book. And we're looking now at who wrote the Bible and when. And I'm going to read some sections of it. And then, um, and then just give my own thoughts. Forty men wrote the 66 books of the Bible. They did so over approximately 1,600 years. The 15th century before Christ, Moses, in exceptional circumstances, led the Hebrews out of slavery in Egypt. Moses lived to the age of 120. His life divided into three periods. Of 40 years each. Born a Hebrew, he was nevertheless brought up at the Egyptian court, where for his 40 years he gained both political and military experience as well as the best education available in his time. Abruptly, Moses was forced to flee into exile after an ill judged and violent attack upon an Egyptian, provoked by his sympathy for the enslaved Hebrews. His own people, he spent the second 40 year period working as a wilderness shepherd in Midian, and it was after that that he assumed the role of the great liberator of his people. Preacher Dwight Moody said, The forty years of Moses' life he was becoming a somebody. The second forty years of his life he was becoming a nobody. The third forty years of his life he was proving to the world that God can do with somebody who is a nobody. In fact, it is likely that Moses accomplished more in the middle phase of his life than learning how to be a nobody and tendering sheep in the desert. But following Moses' death, Joshua led the Hebrews into the land west of the Jordan, and it was with God's domination, do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Soon he was gathering his migrant nation together. Half of them swarmed over the slopes of Mount Gerizim, half over Mount Ebel. There Joshua read all the words of the Lord, just as it is written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that Moses had commanded that Joshua did not read to the whole assembly of Israel. Much later, Joshua was still exhorting the people to obey all that is written in the book of Moses. So you can read Joshua chapter 1 verse 8, Joshua 8, 33, 35 and Joshua 23 verse 6. The book of Moses are accepted as being the Torah of Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. No one is saying that Moses was the only author of the Torah or Pentateuch. Nevertheless, King David, whose reign began in 1050 BC, that is 500 years or so after Moses, accepted that he was principally the author of the five books. Between the golden age of the empire under David and Solomon and the destruction of Jerusalem by the, Bible, by the Babylonians in 586 BC, 586 BC, two other kings, Amaziah and Joshua, Josiah, accepted Moses' authorship. So that's uh, in uh, 2 Kings chapter 2 verse 3, 2 Kings chapter 14 verse 6, 2 Kings chapter 22 verse 8 to 23, verse 8, and then 23, chapter 23 verse 24, 2 Kings 23 verse 24. The first five books of Moses, Genesis, Moses would appear to have written part collated during the middle period of his life, the, Midian, the period in Midian. Exodus extends the narrative beginning in Genesis. In certain statements, Moses is specifically named as having been the author of it. The activities of Moses as a chronicler, as well as lawgiver and a codifier of law, are actually mentioned. The skills used by Moses in authoring Exodus, Numbers and Leviticus and Deuteronomy in the third period of his life had almost certainly been acquired during the higher education of Egypt to which he had been exposed in the first period of his life. Jesus accepted that Moses had written Exodus. Le Leviticus is the core of what Jesus called the law of Moses. Elsewhere he implied that Moses had been a prolific writer. The fifth book of Pentateuch, Deuteronomy, was clearly edited and added, added to since it incorporates the story of Moses' own death. Nevertheless, Jesus and the early Christian leaders, by their words and the use they made of it early, accepting Moses as the main author of Deuteronomy. 
There is a tradition in both Christianity and Judaism that Moses also authored the, profi authored the profoundly reflective and beautifully poetic book of Job, and further that he did so during the middle Midianite period of his life. Per excellence, Job is the book that grapples with the problem, why is the pain, disease and death in a world over which an all-powerful, all all-loving God presides. If the author of, jo author of Job was indeed Moses, he was using Job's story to answer the question, how can people be exploited as slaves in Egypt and God still be God? Through the various speakers in the book, Moses is exploring alternative views of the nature of God and reaching the loving, merciful model which most Jews and Christians adhere. The theological framework of Job leans on Genesis with its account of the fall, the original origin of evil, and its depiction of personal malevolent uh, devil. So, um, when I was at theological seminary, um, we learned about the Valhausen hypotheses, which had been going for about two or three hundred years. And basically, it was saying that there were these various authors that created the Pentateuch. Uh, and over the last 50 years, that theory has crumbled and is in crisis now. And basically what you have to do is you look at the whole book of Moses, books, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and there is an overarching story and framework. So for anybody to come in with literary theories that this has been edited and pieced together by various, various groups, it, it doesn't stand any intellectual credence whatsoever. Unity and diversity, even if you accept that only, say, a part of one of the six books attributed to Moses was actually written by him, you have accepted that the Bible began to be written 3,500 years ago, and since there can be little doubt that the last book of the New Testament was written around the end of the first century AD, you have also accepted that the Bible was 1,600 years in the writing. Having accepted that, you cannot but marvel at the unity of thought, narrative, revelation. Marvel too at the absence of conflict among the message written by 40 different individuals for an immense diversity of backgrounds education, historical periods and geographical locations. Consider the diversity of occupation among the men who wrote the Bible. I think that's a good point to remember that the Bible was written over uh, many, many hundreds of years. Like he said here, the uh, Bible was written 3,000 years ago. And it was 1,600 years in the making. Like it took 1,600 years. And yet, uh, it's all one message. It's all one message about the Messiah. It's all one message. Uh, and that's quite a miracle, really. And uh, you should think about that. So he goes, the, general, the narrative of the book of Joshua, though written in the third person, is widely accepted as having been written by Joshua himself. Uh, a king, the book of Psalms, sorry, a priest, it's, con it's conjectured that the book of Judges was written by Samuel and fairly generally accepted that the first 24 chapters of the first book of Samuel was written by Samuel. Samuel was a priest. A scribe, the remainder of the books of Samuel were written by Nathan and Gad, 1 Chronicles 29, 29. These men were prophets and scribes. The historical narratives of the two books of Kings and the two books of Chronicles represent the compilation of a variety of historical sources, but it's impossible to tell who undertook this painstaking task for the book of Kings. However, insofar as the two books of Chronicles, Ezra and Nehemiah, are closely related to one another in language, style and general points of view, it, is, it, it, it may be assumed that there was one author. The fact that Chronicles ended in the middle of a sentence which is completed in the opening verses of Ezra, may indicate that Ezra was the author. Similarly, there is a close relationship between the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, and the ancients saw them as one book, not two. Evidence in the books themselves suggests that they were written as they were at the very least completed in the period of the Persian dominion, domination of 400 BC. The author Ezra was a priest of a priestly family. King, a king. The book of Psalms is the hymn book of the Bible, hence there is a great diversity of authors. Most notable among them was David the shepherd who became a king. Internal evidence in the book of Proverbs identifies King Solomon as its author, 
Now, there is little doubt that Solomon also wrote Ecclesiastes, a book known as the Song of Solomon, was a king scholar. Prophets, slaves, herdsmen and prime ministers. Some of the prophetic books of the Old Testament were written by professional prophets. Isaiah was an educated Hebrew aristocrat of royal line and he might well have been helped by others. Jeremiah certainly had the assistance of his trusted secretary Baruch. The long indicated and at times puzzling book of Ezekiel was written by a highly educated Hebrew slave working as part of a slave gang in the mudflats of the plains of Babylon near the, uh, the Keba Canal. Hence the Bible can be said to court among its contributors a slave. The book of Daniel by contrast is believed by many to have been written by the man who bears its name, a man who in turn served Babylon and Persian kings in the position of first prime minister. Among the minor prophets is Hosea, a professional prophet, though a rather exceptional one. He is filled with prophetic office for a period in excess of 70 years. Joel is also simply known as a prophet, and Amos is designated a herdsman and a gatherer of sycamore figs. Despite a mention in the Book of Kings, nothing is known about John's, John's occupation. Micah was a younger contemporary of Isaiah, but we do not know his occupation. Zephaniah had a royal heret heredity, and he was descended from Hezekiah. Zechariah was probably a priest. When, Mecca, when Malachi, the last prophet of the Old Testament, came to deliver his message, the period of the exile was a distant memory. Malachi set down his message in 425 BC. Many commentators conjecture that he was a priest. New Testament The four Gospels, the New Testament contains a similar diversity of authors. The Gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, were respectively an officer of the Inland Revenue, an early Christian eager to set down the recollection of his elders, a physician, and then the mystical, well-beloved disciple of Jesus, a tent maker and intellectual. Paul, who wrote most of the letters contained in the New Testament, was a tent maker by trade. In addition, however, he was a theologian and intellectual prior to his conversion to Christianity, one of the leaders of the Jews, Peter the fisherman and the writer. By contrast, Peter was a fisherman. The author of the letter of James might well have been brother of Jesus himself, a motley collection to produce so many books with such great diversity of style, but with equal, equally great uniformity of message and purpose. So we're going to just look at the Gospels. We're going to do another video later on uh, on the authorship of the Gospels. So, But uh, this is just a, a little bit of information. When were the Gospels written? Of the four Gospels, Marx most would agree was written first. How can we know that? Because as we read the first three Gospels, it becomes clear that Matthew and Luke borrowed heavily from Mark. Some stories are told in exactly the same words. The teaching of Jesus is presented in almost identical way. Mark can be divided into 105 sections. Of these 93 occur in Matthew and 81 in Luke. Only four are not included in either Matthew, Luke. Mark has 661 verses. Matthew has 1,068 verses. Luke has 1,149 verses. Of Mark's 661 verses, Matthew reproduced no fewer than 606. Occasionally, he alters the words in slightly, but he reproduces 51% of Mark's actual words. Of Mark's 66 one verses, Luke reproduces 320, 53% of Mark's actual words. The 50 verses, 55 verses of Mark, which Matthew does not reproduce, 31, are found in Luke. Hence, there are only 24 verses in Mark which do not occur in Matthew and Luke. Obviously, Matthew and Luke were based on Mark, and Mark was the first of the Gospels. Hence, Mark is the essential Gospel. Uh, Matthew and Luke even follow Mark's order of events. There is a a fast pace and gripping realism in Mark, over and over again he includes the vivid details of his narratives, evidence that Mark is basing his narrative on eyewitness accounts, almost certainly that of Peter. The fact that Matthew, Mark and Luke have so much in common has led scholars to refer to them as synoptic gospels. The Q source, I'm going to give my own reflections on this in a second. The Q source, there are however 200 additional verses in Matthew and Luke not presented in Mark, these are concerned with what Jesus said was the main preoccupation of Mark 
was with what Jesus did. Scholars have assumed that Matthew and Luke had recourse to another source book in addition to Mark. They are called Q, short for Kuella, the German word for source. The other source, Q, was clearly a book of the sayings of Jesus. Beyond that, no one knows anything about it or has ever been able to find it. So we're going to stop here. Um, and uh, we'll look a bit more at the Gospels and think about the Gospels. But uh, this issue of the Q, um, what can you say? Scholars are very good at imaginative thinking. So they come up with this idea of Q source. Nobody's ever found the Q source. Nobody knows where the Q source is. It's just a complete utter invention by scholars for uh, quite a, a number of years. So when you hear these scholars talk about the Q source, really what it, what it is really, uh, Western academic scholarship, not being uh, post-enlightenment, depending on reason, has to take away the authority of revelation. So in order to take away the theory of revelation, in order to not just read the Gospels and say, right, these are authoritative, they've invented Q source, which takes away the authority of the four Gospels because what it does, it says, look, we've got these four Gospels, but we'll go behind the Gospels and we'll look for the Q source, and that's more authoritative. So in other words, the Q source, I, Q document idea, is a fabrication by scholars. It lacks any real documentary evidence. Uh, and it's basically a post-enlightenment method to undermine the authority of revelation. Um, as, to, as to the issues of uh, how come 51% uh, of Mark, uh, uh, how, how come 51% or 50% is in, of Mark, uh, sorry, how come most of Mark is 50% in, in Matthew? Or fifty one percent and fifty one percent or fifty percent in Luke. How how come there's so much of Mark? Uh, I'll just explain that. Half of the Gospel of Mark has all or nearly all. Sorry, half of the Gospel of Matthew has nearly all of Mark. Half of the Gospel of Luke has nearly all of Mark. So how do we explain that? That's the question. First of all, you've got to be very careful when theories come out we don't really know which came first we, we we believe we have certain ideas that mark came first but those are theories generally most scholars believe mark came first but those are basic theories yeah uh, secondly every historian takes material that they need but then leaves material out that they don't need okay and what we see in Matthew and Mark and, and, and John, like for example, John uh, focuses a lot on uh, the miracles of Jesus. You know, um, Mark focuses, I think, quite a bit on, you know, the exorcisms and uh, it's quite fast flowing. Matthew, there's a lot of the speeches of Jesus. Uh, and I think in Luke there's a lot of the parables of Jesus. So each writer has taken bits of the life of Jesus and emphasised it. And when you do that, you'll leave material out or you'll take material in. Um, I think that the fact that Matthew and Luke uh, use a lot of Mark, or so-called, I think it's because there's a general base story there that shows that the tradition is a firm, solid tradition. Um, and that's why they're able to write very similar. Um, so it, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that they borrowed from Mark. It, it, it could be that actually the tradition has been so well preserved and there's a strong core of a tradition that is so accurate that they've got it in their, in their material and then they've added extra material um, where, where they need to show a different aspect of the life of Jesus. For example, you know, the camera angle, you get four cameras getting four different uh, 
looks at, at, at Jesus. So, so I hope that that's a help. Uh, that's a scholarly meandering in the academic world of the Gospels concerning the Q source. Um, the Gospel of the Jews. Matthew's Gospel is essentially the Gospel written to convince the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. The Gospel of the Gentiles. Luke's Gospel was essentially a Gospel written for the Gentiles. He demonstrates tremendous care in setting out the events of the Gospel narratives in the context of sexual, sec, secular history. To pinpoint the year of Jesus' birth, Luke names the key ruling figures Caesar Augustus Quirinius, governor of Syria, and Herod, king of Judea. Luke is even more careful to date the emergence of John the Baptist, Luke 3, 1, chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. On the issue of the Gospels' historical reliability, very often sceptics like atheists will attack and say, well, Luke's got it wrong on uh, naming Quirinius and, and things like that. And academic scholars will often, uh, those who are not, good at their job, who are not professional as they should be, will make uh, moronic statements like, well, Luke's not accurate. But your best historians, your best intellectual historians who, who, who know better would not make that claim because they know that uh, a, a document, it's either reliable generally or it's not. If it's generally reliable, then there will be a reservation to question uh, certain uh, anomalies that don't seem to add up. So in other words, your best historians are going to be a bit cautious. And Those who are cautious on the issue of Quirinius and various aspects of Luke's uh, historical statements, uh, number one, Luke's been shown to be accurate on many occasions uh, historically. But when you do original research, when you start to look at these questions and, and dig um, for example, uh, I did a lot of research on this issue of Quirinius. Uh, you can find information that even your, your professional secular historians are missing. So in other words, just because historians might say certain things, uh, be very wary, go and do your own research and thinking, and, and go to primary sources and, and, and you'll find often the answer to your question. So, in other words, be very wary when you see when you read about internet atheists attacking the Gospels or the Muslims attacking the Gospels, saying they're not historically accurate. There's a lot of things you've got to go through before you can start saying things like that concerning the four Gospels. The intimate Gospel. John's Gospel is very different from the other three. John's Gospel was written. It is clear that the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke was already available. Perhaps John, the disciple, had been closest to Jesus, read other gospel accounts on his old age and thought that before too late he had to set down on paper his own specific intimate recollections of the life and teaching of Jesus. Written in 50 years, the New Testament books were written in the main, written between AD 50 to AD 100. Clearly Mark was written prior to the death of Peter since he occurred between AD 64, AD 66. Most authorities assume that Mark's gospel was set down at some time between AD 55 and AD 64. Matthew's gospel is more difficult to date. The mention of practices connected with the temple, with the temple tax, means that the book was certainly written before AD 70, when the temple was destroyed. RT France favours AD 63. However, Luke, in addition to his gospel, wrote the book of Acts and addressed both books to Theophilus gives us a number of clues to work on. In some passages in the book of Acts he is writing in the third person, in others he is writing in the first person making it clear that he was actually present. Luke wrote his gospel before he wrote the book of Acts. The book of Acts breaks off suddenly for no logical reason. The simplest explanation for this is that Luke had no more to tell. His narrative had reached the present since the present was the beginning of Paul's first imprisonment in Rome AD 61 to AD 63. Acts was obviously written before AD 63 and Luke's Gospel even earlier. John's writing almost certainly took place entirely in the 90s. However, J.A. Robinson believed that all the Gospels, including John's, were written before AD 70. J.A.T. Robinson was a liberal, a skeptic, an attacker of Christianity. 
And yet he says that the Gospels, even John, were early dates. Uh, in which we find him, John's book of Revelation, in which we find him peering down the corridor of the future towards Apocalypse, was written in, from his exile on the Isle of Patmos. Of the say, say so of Eusebius, we have tended to assume that John's banishment to Patmos occurred during the imperial reign of Domitian. The recent scholarship favours an earlier period, hence the book of Revelation may well have been written before John's three letters, and most would say before John's Gospel, AD 95 or even earlier. Paul's letters, most of the New Testament is taken up with the letters of Paul, whose original name was Saul, began as a member of the Jewish establishment and a precursor of, of the Christians. His conversation to Christ, conversion to Christianity was the most dramatic of all occurred on the road to Damascus. Um, Paul wrote his letters, often from considerable distance, specifically to address problems occurring in those churches. The letter to the Romans, with the exception, when he wrote it, Paul had never been in it to Rome and was therefore addressing no specific problem. That is why the book of Romans is the nearest thing in the New Testament to a systematic exposition of Christian theology. Hence it has been regarded as the most important book in the New Testament and the purest gospel. Frederick Lewis Goddard, 1812-1900 said, Romans is the cathedral of the Christian faith. William Tyndale wrote, Romans is the light and, and way into the whole of scripture. So we've looked at who wrote the Bible, so many different writers. We've looked at the Gospels and uh, basically um, when critics attack the Bible, uh, the Bible as as is many many books with many many writers but one writer above all has been the Holy Spirit and uh, the Holy Spirit used different writers and we read that in 1 Timothy Two Timothy, sorry. Three sixteen, we read, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So the, the Scriptures were God breathed. They, they were breathed out, and God used these various writers: Joshua, Moses, uh, Paul, Peter, Mark. Uh, just, just to say that Mark's based on eyewitness, you know, the Gospel of Mark is based on eyewitness material. Because if you compare the Gospel of Mark with uh, Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2, they're very similar in the style. Uh, so, uh, Mark's based on eyewitness material. But the point that I'm, I'm getting at is that there's so much richness there for any critic to come along like Bar Ehrman or, or the Muslims to attack the Bible. The Bible was written over 1,600 years and it's one united message. It stood the test of time. So many people have attacked it, yet it still stands today. You know, that story of Voltaire who said the Bible would not be in France when he died. His house was turned. Voltaire, the French philosopher, his house was turned into a printing press for Bibles. Uh, the day of burning, when Chairman Mao had a day of burning, he, he, he literally would have one house surrounded, the family's house, with hundreds of red guards. they come into the house, they grab uh, the family, they beat the family up for three days and three nights. This is what often happened. Then they would get one of the family, like a son, beat the living daylights out of that son. That son would more or less die. And if they didn't die, they would go to hospital and die there. And then they would take the Bibles, put them in, grab them, put them in the square and burn them. There are seven, there are hundreds of millions of Christians in China today. Chairman Mao couldn't get rid of the Bible. The Bible is the best-selling book in all time. 
it, 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 wherever it goes, it revolutionises society, and nobody's been able to put it down. It always seems to flourish. Uh, so anybody who attacks it, they think it's an easy target, but it's not an easy target. There's such richness and depth there that uh, we need to respect that, and we need to also respect that it's a divine book from God, and read it prayerfully and with an open heart and we'll find the truth of the message of the Bible which is Jesus Christ who died for you and for me. Thank you for listening. God bless you. We're going to go through some more of this book. God bless.